is concentrated in us. And his name and himself are one. We go back now to the Old Testament where the drama is unfolding. And here is the story of Solus in the first chapter of the book of Exodus. It's the conversation between Moses and God. Now when we use the word Moses or any name in scripture, Jesus Christ, bear in mind these are not persons as you and I are persons. These are states of consciousness through which you, the immortal you, pass. And you pass until you awaken to the being that you really are. So when we speak of Moses, or we speak of Jesus Christ, we are speaking of a state of consciousness. And so, and God said to Moses, or Moses said to God, And when I come to the people of Israel, and I say that God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say? And God said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, I am. That is who I am. And say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And by this name I shall be known throughout all generations. Now here is an adumbration. Here is a foreshadowing. In this state of consciousness, as the word Moses means, Moses means that which is to be born. It is the old perfection of the Egyptian verb to be born. Something is coming to birth. It has not yet been born. So Moses cannot go into the promised land, if you know the story. He remains back, and he dies, and no one knows the burial place of Moses. There is a state of consciousness that does not enter. It's a foreshadow of that which must be born in man. So he hears us coming from without. What eventually must be heard from within. So I hear us coming from without, a God speaking. And here, the God is speaking, seemingly coming from outside of my being. And the God is saying to me, I am. That is who I am. And say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And by this name I shall be known throughout all generations. Eventually, that which is heard seemingly from without must be heard from within. When it is heard from within, the world will not believe in it. The world is trained, on its present level, to believe in an external causation, something coming from without, as the cause of the phenomena of my life that I am a victim of this, that, and the other, that someone else did. Call it by any name, but it's something on the outside. Eventually, it comes within man, and what is heard in the beginning, coming from without, is now heard from within. And that is called, in Scripture, in the New Testament, Jesus Christ. The God of the Old Testament, that seemingly spoke from without, through his prophet. Now in the new speaks from within, in man. So we are told in the New Testament, do you not realize that Jesus Christ is within you? Well, you ask that of any Christian in the world, they'll read it in their own scripture, but they do not believe. They talk and they speak of a Christ from the outside, some not some being who lived 2,000 years ago. And they turn to him and pray to him. They stick him on the wall and cross themselves for love. 
That is not the God of Scripture. The God of Scripture comes from within. Eventually everything said in the New Testament, which was an unembraced statement in the Old, you are going to experience coming from within. Now, it starts in this manner. And the woman of Samaria said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. He will tell us all things. And then Jesus answers. And you think Jesus is speaking from the outside. Let's go back now to the statement. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is within you? And now forget completely any Jesus Christ who is talking in history from the outside. It's all from the inside. What originally seemed to come from the outside in man's early stage has actually begun to awaken from within. So Christ is speaking out from within and you and I, we are the woman at the well of Samaria. This well of Jacob where the woman came to draw water. And now from within us we are hearing a voice coming from within ourselves. And it is I who speak to you and he. I am he. What I am he? Never John, Mary, no. Your own wonderful human imagination. Your awareness of being, that is the being that is the one spoken of in the beginning of Scripture as a God. God became as I am, that I may be as He is. So God actually became man and took upon Himself the limitations of man. And in time he awakens in man as the man in whom he entered. He entered into me. He entered into you. And he in you is your own wonderful human imagination. That is I am. That is God. Now take all the I am statements in the book of John. Or the gospel for that matter. But John has them all. Unless you believe that I am He, you die in your sins. You're praying to a false God when you pray to something on the outside. If you pray to the true God, you appropriate that which you ask for. It's a subjective appropriation of the objective hope. That's how you pray. A billion people drop to their knees and pray. Well, who is listening? Who is listening when you pray? Is it not something coming from within? Do you believe in the reality of what you have seen? You are called upon to assume that you are, or that things are, as you desire them to be. So the subjective appropriation of the objective hope is prayer. So unless you believe that I am He, you die in your sin. Sin is to miss the mark. You will miss the mark in life unless you dare to appropriate that feeling and then sustain it with you, as though it were true. How no one knows, but you walk in faith. Those who know thy name, says the psalmist, put their trust in thee. For well, the name is not Jehovah, the name is not God, the name is not Jesus, the name is not Jesus Christ, the name is I Am. You can't really pronounce the name I Am in Hebrew. It's in four consonants, yod hey vav hey. He translates the four consonants as the Lord. All right, so we give it a son. But the minute you say the Lord, you think of something on the outside. But when you say I am, you can't think of something on the outside. How can you say I am and tell any place? You can say I am rich, I am poor. I am known, I am unknown. I am this, that, or anything else in the world. But I am is basic. It is the root of all. That is the God of Scripture. That is the God of whom the Scripture speaks. The God that no one is talking about because they put him on the outside. And they pray to that which is not something that is real. And they bow before some little 
silly thing that man made with his hands, not knowing that man himself is the temple in whom God dwells. And God dwelling in man is man's own wonderful human imagination. That is God. Now you're called upon this to put into the text. Everything said concerning this being, I know from experience to be true. And when you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know that I am He. Well, how is the Son of Man lifted up? We are told in Scripture, as Moses in the desert lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Well, that's an adumbration. That is a foreshadowing. We are told that all the things of whom he spoke, and Moses is the thing of consciousness, they were copies, they were shadows of the reality. So you copy what you saw. You saw something like a serpent move up, and you copied it. It moved up, and so you made a copy of the reality. Now comes the reality. Will I experience that reality yet? I have experienced that reality. As Moses in the wilderness lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Well, in my own case, suddenly I was split in two from top to bottom. This body, evenly this body, at the base of the spine was golden liquid light. And as I contemplated it, I knew it was myself. And as I contemplated it, I fused with it. And fusing with it, like a fiery serpent, I ascended into my own skull. That's the only heaven in the world. This is the heaven, into your own wonderful skull, but you ascend like a fiery serpent. So as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Then you know who the Son of Man is. And he's called in Scripture, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is what? Your own I am. Because who is it up? I am. I went up. Not another. I went up. So I know exactly what he's talking about. So everything said of him, I have experienced. So I'm sharing with you my own experiences. These things are true. They are literally true. But they're told in a language that is figurative. So it's not a serpent on the outside to whom you turn that you have secured. It is the serpent in your own being. You are the being that came down into this world. You are the being that will rise up out of this world. You came down into generations and you will play your part fully. And at the end, you will simply ascend into regeneration. It's for a purpose, not a thing you did in this world that was wrong to bring you down into this world. It was a challenge of God. And God came down. There's only God in the world. There is nothing but God. God plays all the parts of the world. Every man in this world is God playing a part. And when you know it, you can see every being is yourself pushed up. And having it pushed it, you can tell them exactly how this whole thing is taking place. So unless you believe that I am me, will continue missing the mark in life. Well now, if I really believe that I am he, and I have a goal in life, how do I go about getting it? Well now, what would the feeling be like if you had it? What would the feeling be like if you had it? Well, dare to assume the feeling of that wish fulfilled. If you dare to assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled, who is doing it? God is doing it. So God is I am. So if you say, I am, and you name it, even though reason denies it and your senses deny it, if you persist in that assumption, that assumption will harden into fact. This is the story of Scripture. But as long as you believe in a God outside, who looks over the entire picture, and you do not believe for one moment that he actually bears within you, you have a power of God. So God comes first seemingly speaking to us as one coming from without. And so Moses said to God, or said to God, something on the outside, and then God said to Moses. But the word Moses means to be born. 
Here is something that is coming to birth. And when he comes to birth, he is the God who will walk within man. He can come to birth from without man, for man is the cradle in whom God is born. This is the great manger. This is the tomb in which God buried himself. God himself entered death's door, the human skull, and laid down in the grave for those who entered. He visions of eternity. And when the fullness of time comes, he awakes, and the one in whom he laid down awakes as God. You are not something less than, you awake as the God who entered the grave. So God so loved you, his emanation that he actually shared with you in that tomb the dream of life. And when the dream comes to its end, you and God, who entered with you, are one. My emanation, yet my wife, till the sleep of death is past. So God enters the human skull, which is the grave, the only supper for the world where God is buried. That is the Golgotha, spoken of in Scripture. That is Calvary. And when God entered character, the human skull, that was the incarnation of God. That was the beginning of the drama. And then he moves towards death again, which is when you awake as God. So God becomes man at Calvary, which is called the crucifixion in Scripture, that man may become God at death again. So the whole thing takes place in the skull of man. And man is here for the most divine purpose in the world, to awaken as God himself, because there is only God in the world. Now said you, I will tell you these things before they take place, that when they do take place, you may believe, what? That I am he. It's not a being on the outside talking to me. For if Jesus Christ, who is the Lord, is speaking, and Jesus Christ is within me, it has to take place within me. So it's not a being on the outside talking to me and telling me as I'm talking to you. It is within me the drama is taking place. But to understand it and to write it, it is told in the form of a story. So truth in body in a tale shall enter in at lowly doors. So you take this fantastic story. And you have to tell it in the form of a story. How would you tell it? A man talking to another man. Or the man talking to the woman at the well. And so you tell it in the form of a story. And eventually that story, so it's seemingly between two people that are external to each other, is actually unfolding within oneself and the whole thing is taking place within one being. You are the God of the Bible. You are the Jesus Christ of the Bible. But in the beginning, in your sleep, he talks as coming from without. And eventually, he unfolds from within. And you realize that you yourself are the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the end, there is only the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Lord Jesus Christ is not a name. It's your own wonderful, I am him. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other Jesus Christ. If he is within me, what is the center of my own being? I am. Can I go any place and leave it behind me? To listen to the word. I am with you always. Even to the very end of time. Can you get away from being I am? In a dream, who is dreaming? I am. And who wakes in the morning? I am. You can't get away from I am. You can't get away from God. So God is omnipresent. God is imminent. He is actually indwelling. And you can't get away from God. Now, if you believe in God, you must first believe in your own wonderful human imagination. For if all things are possible to God, well then, all things are possible to your own wonderful human imagination. Now what does it take to make it become real in my world? Faith. Faith in God. Biblical faith is faith 
in God as Savior. Well, saving is not only the saving from the ultimate, which is death, but the saving from everything in the world that can function from which I would like to escape. No matter what it is, maybe I'm organized and can't pay my rent. That is a problem. Well, can God save me? Yes. The ultimate would be to save me from death. But before that moment in time, there are so many things from which I could escape. I must turn to God. Well, I can't turn to any God on the outside. I can turn to God, if I really turn to Him, on the inside. He dwells on the inside. He is my own wonderful I am. My consciousness. My imagination. That is God. So if you really would believe in God, then we come from that original state where he speaks seemingly from without, to which means when I hear him not as another, I myself experience all these things, so I can say to anyone what I did it. I woke within my own skull. There wasn't another who woke. I came out of my own skull. There wasn't another who came out. So I was born from above, as told in Scripture. I arose from the grave, or the grave was my skull. That was the sepulchre. With I who found the essence of all the things that I've ever done in this world, and the essence put together and personified was a son, and his name was David. And so all the things I've ever done in eternity, and I've played all the parts in the world. At the very end, when they all are gathered together and personified, that is a son. Now I know that God is not only the power of the universe, he is a father, a loving father. And then come dreams in my world. The biggest thing I've ever done, at the moment sometimes it was bitter. Sometimes I was disgusted with the things that I do. But in the end, I realized it was all love. It was all love. Did you ever have a dream where you embraced one that you loved dearly? The most intimate embrace. And then the face turns and changes and it's the face of another you want to embrace. And then another, and then another, and then another. And all of a sudden you realize that all these, though some turn bitter, and some turn, well, horrible in your world, at that moment of the embrace it was love. And then as you begin to awaken from it all, you realize that everything in this world you brought into being through love. So we are told in Scripture that God is take past love. And love is not love. It is also, also. If I fall in love with something and suddenly it is not what I thought I fell in love with. And then I change. That is not love, not the love of scripture. For love is not love which alters when it alteration finds. And I've had these experiences where suddenly, everything in the world, that I once loved, and then in one wonderful night, you fall in love with the moment, the present one that you really love, to find that as you're embracing her, if you be man, or if you be woman, embracing him, and all these things change, and their faces come on the same being, and you realize the whole vast thing you love. Even though it seems, to have changed in your journey from love to hate, but in the end of the journey, it is all love. And all play their part in your world. And all are forgiven in the end because it's all love. It's all one. I hope you've had it. If you haven't had an experience, you are going to have it. So that in the end, everything is forgiven. Everything was created in love. And there's only God in the world, and God is your own wonderful human imagination. That is God. And with God, all things are possible. Everything is possible. So in this world, if you really believe the story, that 
He is in, called in the New Testament, Jesus Christ. Called in the Old Testament, Jehovah, or the Lord, or God. It's the same thing. But it really means, I am. So when I come to the people of Israel, and they say to me, who sent you? What is the thing? Just say to them, I am. That is who I am. And if they ask you for my name, just say, I am a sensitive. And this is my name forever. And by this name, I shall be known throughout all generations. But he heard it as coming from without. Eventually, he who is to be born, for that's what the name means, Moses is to be born. When that which is within him is born, then it comes not from without, it comes from within. And he hears it rising within himself, that I am he. And so and so, to the woman of Samaria, or to any other person, I am he. You say, he will come, he has come. I am he. Not a little thing called Neville. I'm speaking now of the being within us, the one being in all of us. And all will awaken to discover that he is God. There's nothing but God. And so I tell you before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe. Believe what? That I am he. Before Abraham was, I am. Or before Abraham, was I am. Put the punctuation mark where it suits you best. But before the world was, I am. Or before the world was I am. It has no beginning, it has no end. And deliberately and purposely came down into a world of death. For everything here begins and ends. It dies. Everything dies in this world, including the stars. They're fading. They may take unnumbered light years, but they're dying. Everything dies. And that which cannot die, it has no beginning or end, comes down into the world of death and conquers the last enemy, which is death. You cannot die, or nothing dies. But tonight, you can put it to the extreme test in something that you can prove in this temporal world, which will vanish anyway, but you prove it. And see, the whole thing comes into this world. And I can tell you the thrill that is in store for you, because your memory returns, and the long last language of symbolism returns with it. And things that the world will simply put aside as meaning nothing, that comes to you in the form of a dream has the most wonderful significance in the world. That which has no significance to the world and they're simply eliminated and they turn to a Freud or turn to his disciples and try to give meaning and all based upon what they call sex. I'm not denying the importance of sex in the world as generation. But every little symbol in your dream is so important. When memory returns, everything comes back with it, and you see it so clearly. Here is a simple, simple little experience. It has happened to me through the years. <coughs> In the story, Joshua, which means Jesus, and Jesus and Joshua is Jehovah. The same Yahweh Baal is the root of the word. So Yahweh Bab is the root of <coughs> Jehovah, Yahweh Bab is the root of Joshua or Jesus. And Joshua goes because Moses cannot say, he is to be born. Joshua, which is the Lord, is born. So he goes into the promised land. And he takes with him one. And the one is Caleb. Well, Caleb in Hebrew means the dog. It also means a male heart who serves the priest in the temple. But the symbol is a dog, <coughs> as told us in the 22nd Psalm, the dog surrounding. 
Well, the word here is his companion who goes with him into the promised land. And here, whatever I have seen in my dream, a dog, I'm walking with a dog, or the dog is in the hand of another. And when the dog defecates, right before me, in a generous manner, I've always known that a very large sum of money will come to me. If it defecates twice, before it comes so soon, I am not even up to receive it. Now, it doesn't make sense to the world. Well, yesterday morning, I woke at five. I was having this wonderful experience, and here was a dog. It began as some other kind of an animal, and finally it became a dog. And as the person leading it, turned it right on the side of all, it defecated in a generous amount, walked a foot or two, and repeated the act. For scripture tells us that if the vision repeats itself, it means that the thing has been fixed by God, and it will shortly come to pass. Well, I was alone at 8.15. I thought, now this is the time I was shaved and bathed. My head was under the shower and I was taking the shampoo. And I heard that there's a dog in our apartment. I don't own a dog. But my daughter has a dog and she leaves her business four days a week. Well, it so happens, yes, it was the day that she left the dog with me. She's barking like mad and it's only about 8.15. I said, who on earth could be disturbing the dog? My head was full of shampoo. And I got that out. I threw a robe open and went to the front door, and here was a postman on the outside. He was just about to leave when I saw him, and then I opened the door, and he stuck a letter to the special edition. I had no time at all that, so I threw it on the table, went back and completed my shampoo and completed my chores for the morning. When I came out, I opened the letter, and my brother sent me a check for $2,500. It's not a dividend check. Just sent me a check for $2,500. Now here, the world will laugh at a thing like this. But see, when you awaken from the dream of life, memory returns. And with the memory, the language of symbolism returns. And all dreams are symbols telling you the most fantastic story in the world. And here was the dream. And here it was so the defecation took place twice. The defecated twice. Which means it was shortly come to pass. It came so shortly I almost missed it. So I am with my head full of shampoo. And here is ringing the bell which I would not have heard were it not for the dog. And the dog is walking at someone who is ringing the doorbell. Because under the shower, I could never have heard him if he only rang the doorbell. But the dog is walking. I wonder what on earth is Sandy doing? For his name, by the way, is Sandy. <laughs> and so, I went out and I wondered, what are you doing? And here is the postman taking this thing. And I also apologized for my appearance, for I was full of water and put a robe on me. And he gave me a check. Now here is this thing, it was not a dividend check. It was not something doing me at all. Just send me. Now I tell you, this is how the law operates in this world. It's a fantastic thing. It all is from one source. There is only God in the world. There is nothing but God. God speaks to man through the medium of dreams. But man doesn't understand the language of God because he's not yet awakened to the language of God. One day he will awaken from the dream of life and every little thing simple of the world will have meaning. To the average person that would be a most offensive thing to watch. You walk down the street and some lady instead of curbing the dog allows it to use the sidewalk and you've got to step over it and you're offended. And everything here also is a dream. 
but people don't realize it. Everything here is real, a symbol. Every one of the world is a symbol. The whole vast world is a symbol, screaming at us from the outside. One day you understand it from the inside. And so I am he. When I tell you, it's not a man standing on a platform, begging that he is the one. I am telling you, you one day will know that I am, meaning yourself, I am he. At first it comes to you as one from without. And so he heard the voice as one coming from without, saying, Say unto them, I am. I sent me to you. And this is my name forever, to be known throughout all generations. But you shall not enter, for you are not yet born. For Moses means to be born. So he cannot go into this born. For the thing that goes in in place of Moses is Joshua. And the word Joshua is the Hebraic form of Jesus. And Jesus and Joshua the same, and the both are Jehovah. The same root, Yod, Hey, Bob. Yod, Hey, Bob, Hey would be the four continents, and they have Yod, Hey, Bob, Shinayim. It's the same root form, meaning salvation. Jehovah saves. Jehovah is salvation. But as long as you hear it as something coming from without, you don't really believe it. But if you can begin now, before you are born, to believe in the name, and those who believe in thy name put their trust in thee. If I put my trust in thee even before I am born, it will work. But I must know who he is. And who is he? My own wonderful human imagination. That is God. If I could believe that my imaginal act is a fact, I'm then to think in a sense without effort, just as though it were fact. I call a friend of mine on the telephone and I spoke to him and I heard what he said. And I believe what he said. Well, now this is the same matter. You treat it just as lightly as that, with faith. Faith in the reality of the unseen state. If I really believe it, this subjective assumption, that subjective appropriation of the objective hope, and what is all it were true, it will come to pass. It will all come to pass. This is what I'm talking about. Morning, noon, and night. Now the world will not believe it. And may I tell you, I know that eventually there is going to believe it, so really I'm not distressed. I'm not breaking any blood vessels to compel them to believe it because I really don't care. Because I am convinced eventually everyone will believe in God. And the God of Israel is the only God. But that God comes to its fulfillment in man, in the New Testament. The New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. There's only one. Here is the tree, and here is the fruit. So the New Testament fulfills it, but the New Testament, as understood by one billion who call themselves Christians, they don't understand it at all. They still do the same external worship of the old world. And they believe that that makes them a Christian by attending Mass or attending service, by contributing to their church. But these are lovely things if you want to do it. Certainly all right, nothing wrong about it. But that is not what the Bible is talking about. The Bible is telling you of the most fantastic thing in the world, that God became man, that man may become God. And Calvary begins it. Calvary is crucifixion. It's not the end of the drama, it's the beginning of the drama. And you and I have already been crucified with God. Or we couldn't even breathe. The very moment you breathe as a child, that was the death of God. The very first breath that a child takes, and it closes its little lungs and cries, that's the death of God. And that was the life of man. Man lived through the death of God. That's the crucifixion. There is no other crucifixion. Forget the little cross of wood. Forget all the little things you're taught, it's told about. The death of God is the birth of a child. That's when God died. And the breath was his life. And the breath was God. For the word 
spirit. And the word zin are the same in both Hebrew and Greek. So they're very blessed when the child dreams for the first time. That was the death of God. His complete and utter forgetfulness of his God and the living of man. And then he's moving towards Bethlehem. And Bethlehem is then the awakening of God who had died to make that child alive. So Calvary begins the drama and Bethlehem is the awakening in man. Man as God. So when he awakens, who awakens? I. And who is experiencing? I am. And that's the thing. That's God's name. You try it tonight. And you'll realize that I'm telling you the truth. So I tell you before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe, believe what? That I am He. And all the things you say, you're going to experience. He said, I am the light of the world. May I tell you that it's true? One night, in 1926 it was, or 27, I was in New York at the Larchmont Show Club. I was either 21 or 22, for I was born in 1905. And there was a huge big dance going on. Well, that was the day of prohibition. But prohibition was only a name. It was as much liquor serving then as there is today. If you knew where to get it, you could get it. And so there's all kinds of liquor. But this was a dance for the young people. Well, I was only 21 or 22, but I was the guest of the assistant manager of the club. And he didn't think that I, his guest, should mingle with the guests and the members of the club. That would be inappropriate, because that was simply not quite the thing that he thought to be. So I was simply his guest, and he was only an assistant manager, and these were simply the members of the club, and I shouldn't mingle with the members or their guests. So I went to bed, and I did something that I rarely do. I read in bed. And I had this book. It was a book on the life of Buddha. And here, I'm reading the book, I have the light on, and the music is playing, and I long to dance all through the night, for I was a professional dancer. I would not have gone downstairs with my dancing partner, who was my, my friend's daughter, who in body was to be changed. And I would have not have gone downstairs and danced, but he thought it unwise for his position to have me do it. So I sat in bed, and I reclined, reading the book, and the next thing I knew, it's about nine in the morning. The light is still burning at the head of my bed. The sound of music is over. Everything is still. And here I am at nine in the morning with the book sat on my chest, which means I did not turn in the course of the evening. I fell into a trance, a cataleptic state. So the book is still open on my chest, the light is on, and it's now nine in the morning. I must have fallen off about ten that night. So here almost twelve hours of a cataleptic faith. And in that interval, I was infinite life. There was no star. There was nothing but infinite pulsing living life. Nothing but life. And here I am, the thinker without the comfort. Infinite life. Living house in life. So when you're told in scripture, he who speaks from within, I am the light of the world. I know that from experience. And the world is simply my emanation. Yet my life, till the seat of death, is fast. So the whole vast world is yourself for self. The day will come, you will know from experience, you are the light of the world. Everything said in that scripture is true, literally true. But when you read it, the words are physical. And you can quite grasp it. How could you be the light of the world? When our little son is only a piece of part of 
infinity of light. But it dwarfs, it is dwarfed by all the other great suns and their constellations. And yet, I know from experience that you take the whole vast infinite world of suns and their constellations. And this light contains all, contains all, and gets it all got it out. It's only light. Living, wonderful, pulsing light without circumference, and you the center, and the center is I am. So you are the God of Scripture. And to really understand the God of Scripture, you must understand his name. And his name is concentrated in you.